Hello, my name is Dr. Jacob Hudis. Welcome to Mastering Quantum Mechanics Through Problems. This presentation is titled Understanding Spin One Half Dynamics. If you want to understand quantum mechanics, this is the lesson to watch because I'll be solving an extremely important problem. Today, I'll solve a problem involving a spin one half particle in a magnetic field, focusing on the results of measuring its spin along the x, y, and z direction. This problem is foundational for technologies like NMR and superconducting quantum computing. Understanding it is essential for grasping the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. While there is a classical analogy, it only partially applies and can be misleading. Focusing solely on the classical view can lead to significant confusion. Though this problem can seem challenging, it becomes straightforward with the right visualization. By paying close attention and thinking critically, you'll gain valuable insight into quantum mechanics and spin one-half dynamics. On this slide and the next, I'll discuss the problem setup and the actual question that I'm going to solve. On the following slides will be a picture to visualize this important problem. Terrific! These are the three poly matrices, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, which are fundamental to understanding spin one-half particles and the precession of spin one-half particles in magnetic fields. I've created several videos on these matrices, and I'll link them in the video description. The eigenvectors for all the matrices are given here, as well as their associated eigenvalues, which are plus and minus one. When a spin one-half particle is placed in a magnetic field along the x-axis, the Hamiltonian is negative some constant times sigma x. The Hamiltonian is derived from experimental results, and in this problem, I aim to demonstrate how the mathematics models the physical experiment. The question of why this is the Hamiltonian is crucial. By understanding this problem, along with the visuals I'll present, my aim is to answer that question. The goal of this problem is to provide you with a comprehensive understanding of a spin one-half particle in a magnetic field and explain why the Hamiltonian takes this form. It arises from modeling the experiment. On this slide, I'm going to read the question, but then before I go through and solve it, I want to give you some visuals to try to understand what the question is asking and how to visualize a spin one-half particle in a magnetic field. Here's the Hamiltonian, and here's the state psi at t equals zero. At time t equals zero, the system is prepared with spin up in the z direction. The state is prepared in the diagonal z basis, where the wave function at t equals zero is equal to one zero. Part A. Obtain the state of the particle psi of t at an arbitrary time t greater than zero. Part b. Given that the particle was initially prepared in the spin-up state, compute the probability as a function of time that the measurement of the spin along the z-axis will yield the spin-down result. Part c. If you measure the spin along the y-direction, what possible values will you get, and what are the probabilities as a function of time? Now I want to talk about the picture that we're discussing in the problem that I'm about to solve. On the next slide, there will be an animation. A spin one-half particle processes about a magnetic field. While there are classical analogies to this behavior, they do not fully capture the quantum reality. In this scenario, the magnetic field is along the x-axis. This is the magnetic field pointing along the x-axis. The spin component along the x-axis is precisely h-bar over 2. There's no uncertainty. That is not the case with the z and the y-axis. The other two axes have uncertainty. The average spin component along the z and y axes are zero. However, there is uncertainty in the measurement along these axes. Repeated measurements may yield different results. The spin can be measured along the x, y, and z direction using a stern gerlach type apparatus. Each measurement must be done individually, and measuring the spin along one axis alters the state of the particle. I will briefly discuss the measurement process later. For now, it's important to understand that the measurement can be set up and made. You can measure the spin along the x, y, or z directions, but not all at the same time. For now, I just want you to understand, without knowing the details, this is the total spin. It's possible to measure the component of the spin along the z-axis, it's possible to measure the component of the spin along the y-axis, and it's possible to measure the component of the spin along the x-axis. So for right now, let's not worry about the details of how you can do it. I just want you to understand it's possible to do, and you can do it. Here's an animation. The magnetic field is along the x-axis, and the spin is processing. It's spinning, and its projection along the x-axis is always h-bar over 2. Let's freeze time for an instant. At this specific time, suppose I measure the z component of the spin. The outcome would be h bar over two, just as if we treated the vector classically. This is the spin. There's a projection of the spin onto the z-axis. This works just as if this were a classical vector. Now let's stop at this point in time. 
Now the projection onto the z-axis is smaller than it was before. So let's assume that if we project this, the z projection is h bar over 4, smaller than it was before. If this were classical physics, measuring the z component would give h bar over 4 because that would be the projection onto the z-axis. However, in quantum mechanics, the situation is different. If I measure the z component of spin now, the result is not h bar over 4. It's either plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2 with certain probabilities for each outcome. The particle is in a quantum superposition of both spin up and spin down states. This is the essence of what I'm trying to convey. This is the entire point. Quantum measurements don't simply give a classical projection. Let's let the spin process, and now I'm gonna stop time right here. At this point, the projection along the z-axis is zero. Classically, if we wanted to measure the spin of this particle along the z-direction, the answer would be zero. However, in quantum mechanics, if we were to measure the spin of this particle along the z-axis, it has 50% chance to be z up and 50% chance to be z down. Even if the spin's projection along the z-axis is zero, a measurement would yield plus h bar over two or minus h bar over two, each with a 50% probability. The particle is in a superposition and the outcome of the measurement is governed by the quantum probabilities, not classical determinism. Now let's solve the problem. Part A says, Obtain the state of the particle psi as a function of time for any arbitrary time t greater than or equal to zero. Recall this is the Hamiltonian and this is the state of the particle at time t equals zero. Let me remind you, the rules of quantum mechanics are as follows. One, find the eigenstates and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. In this case, this is the Hamiltonian. Two, write the initial state vector as a linear combination of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. 3. Multiply each eigenstate in the sum by the phase factor e to the minus i e t over h bar, where e is the energy corresponding to the given eigenstate. These are the fundamental rules of quantum mechanics established through the scientific method, observation, hypothesis, experimentation, and analysis. While they may seem abstract or challenging at first, consider them akin to the rules of classical mechanics such as applying Newton's laws or Lagrange's equations. You may find classical mechanics more intuitive because of our everyday experiences, but the same principle applies. Once you accept these rules as the framework of solving quantum problems, your understanding will deepen. By embracing this procedure and applying it consistently, just as you would with any set of scientific rules, you will find that quantum mechanics becomes much more approachable. Bingo! I encourage you to follow along with this problem and additional examples I will present in this playlist. Mastering this procedure will make your journey through quantum mechanics significantly easier. This is the method for solving quantum mechanics problems. Learn it, practice it, and it will serve you well. The first step is finding the eigenstates and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian. These are the two eigenstates. E plus is equal to 1 over root 2, 1 minus 1. E minus is equal to 1 over root 2, 1, 1. The eigenvalue for this state is an energy of plus alpha. The eigenvalue for this state is an energy of minus alpha. That's the first step in solving any quantum mechanics problem. Step two, write the initial state as a linear combination of the eigenstates. The initial state is psi of zero is equal to one zero. Psi of zero is equal to some amount a times the eigenvector e plus, plus some amount b times the eigenvector e minus. To find the values a and b, we take the inner product of psi of zero with e plus. This tells us how much of psi of zero is along e plus. To find b, we take the inner product of psi of zero with e minus. This tells us how much of psi of zero is along e minus. For example, a equals the inner product of e plus with psi of zero. We write e plus as a row vector. This is our initial state psi of zero and it's equal to one over root two. You can find b doing the same thing. And what we get is the wave function at time t equals zero is equal to one over root two times e plus plus one over root two times e minus. Step three, multiply each eigenstate in the sum by the phase factor e to the minus i e t over h bar. In this case, e plus is gonna be plus alpha and e minus is gonna be minus alpha. I write down psi of t is equal to a times e plus times e to the minus i alpha t over h bar plus b times e minus times e to the plus i alpha t over h bar. That's because I replace e in this case I replaced e with minus alpha, and here I replaced e with plus alpha. My coefficient a was one over root two, e plus is one over root two, one minus one, e minus is one over root two, one, one, the coefficient is one over root two, 
And now we have the state psi as a function of time. There's just a little bit of algebra to finish this. I replace the complex exponentials with the sum of sine and cosine. This is equal to cosine of alpha t over h bar minus i sine of t of, minus i sine of alpha t over h bar. And this complex exponential is equal to cosine of alpha t over h bar plus i sine of alpha t over h bar. And the simple algebra leaves us with psi of t, the wave function as a function of time, is cosine of alpha t over h bar, i sine of alpha t over h bar. This is the answer to part A. Part B says, given that the particle was initially prepared in the spin-up state, compute the probability as a function of time that a measurement of the spin along the z-axis will yield the spin-down result. So we know that we started out with the spin pointing upward. The question is, if I measure it later in time, what's the probability that I'll get a result of negative h bar over 2, so we'll be switching from spin up to spin down. In order to compute this, we take the inner product of negative z, where negative z corresponds to h bar over 2, with our wave function as a function of time, and we square it. This is the way that you calculate probabilities in quantum mechanics. The inner product of s z equals minus 1 half onto psi of t squared is equal to the bra 0, 1 times your wave function as a function of time squared, and this equals to sine squared of alpha t over h bar. At time t equals 0, if I make a measurement of the, spe of the spin in the z direction, there's a 0% probability I'm going to measure spin down because it's pointing spin up. As time goes on, if I make a measurement, there's going to be a finite probability of measuring spin down, negative h bar over 2 projection along the z-axis. And eventually there will be a 100% chance of measuring its spin down. And the probability oscillates between 0 and 100% and 0 and 100%, and the probability keeps oscillating because the particle is processing about the magnetic field which is in the x direction. Finally, for part c, if you measure the spin along the y direction, what possible values will you get? and what are the probabilities as a function of time. The y spin can be plus or minus h bar over 2. So when this y spin is equal to minus h bar over 2, the way that you calculate probabilities in quantum mechanics is you take the inner product of the state y equals negative h bar over 2, and psi, the wave function, which is a function of time, and then you square it. This is the way you calculate probabilities in quantum mechanics. Negative y written in bra notation is 1 over root 2 1i, and psi of t is cosine of alpha t over h bar and i sine of alpha t over h bar. You take the inner product and you square it. This gives you 1 half cosine squared plus 1 half sine squared. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1, and so you get 1 half, which tells you there's a 50% probability of measuring the spin in the minus h bar over 2 direction for all time. For the setup in this particular problem, any time you make a measurement of the spin in the y direction, there's a 50% chance you're going to measure sy is equal to minus h bar over 2. The other possibility is sy equals plus h bar over 2. The calculation is very similar, and again, you get 50%. For this problem, if you make a measurement of the spin in the y direction, there's a 50% chance you'll get h bar over 2, and a 50% chance you'll get minus h bar over 2, and that will hold for all time. If a spin one-half particle begins in the spin-up state along the z-axis and is placed in a magnetic field directed along the x-axis, measuring the spin along the z-axis will yield either h bar divided by 2 or negative h bar divided by 2. The probability of obtaining these results oscillates periodically with a frequency determined by alpha divided by h bar, where alpha is related to the strength of the magnetic field. This probability distribution changes over time in a predictable manner. If you measure the spin along the x-axis or the y-axis, the result will always have a 50% probability of being plus h-bar divided by 2 and a 50% probability of being negative h-bar divided by 2. This 50-50 probability remains constant over time for measurements along the x and y-axis. In the comments section below, share your thoughts on why measuring the spin along the z-axis oscillates predictably between spin up and spin down, while a measurement along the x-axis or y-axis always shows an equal 50-50 probability of plus h-bar divided by 2 and negative h-bar divided by 2. If you think you have the answer and want to share it with others, please post your explanation in the comments pin the most insightful response to the top. At the farmer's market with my so-called girlfriend, she hands me her cell phone and says, it's my dad. Man, this isn't my dad. It's a cell phone.